How's it going? And welcome to episode 101 of On The Wire, a proud member of the Picture List Podcast Network. Follow the pod on the Twitter at On The Wire Pod. You can follow me at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. You can follow Kevin at Hastings Kevin. We have a great show lined up today as we start our own preview episodes. We're going to do things a little bit differently than you may have heard on other pods. There's You can find podcasts previewing player pool based on position. You can find them based on major league teams. And those all have their own merit for what they do. And they're great. You should make sure you're listening to them, get as much advice as possible. But we are going to focus on the categories, the things that you're actually trying to get to win your leagues, the things that we focus on in season when we're looking at fab. Kevin, before we get into all the weeds on that, we made it to the other side of 100. And we are on our way in triple digits. <laughs> it's an exciting time. I feel like we haven't lost a spark. Here we are one week later, still at it. Glad to be back with you, man. How you doing? Doing great. As we're recording, we have Grapefruit League baseball games three weeks from today. It, it's amazing. That it, what, a, what a time to be alive. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, man. What, why great is a grapefruit? I didn't look at the schedule. The grapefruit just starts earlier than cactus. No, and I might have said that backwards. It might be actually be cactus leagues, but because uh, I think Either there's way. two games that Friday and then team games on Saturday, but the, the, it's within a day of each other. Sure. You can't it very, it, you never be so excited to watch games that don't matter. Um, exactly. They do. <laughs> they matter to <laughs> us. All right. Like I said, we're going to be doing our preview episode starting today, breaking down category or groups of categories the same way we break down our fab bidding process during the season, the kind of things that we're looking for in season rather than by position. And to help us break down those targets that we can find later on in the drafts or even possibly the first few weeks of the season. We are joined this week by our very special guest, Art Tornabeen. Art from the Triple Pay, Triple Play Fantasy Baseball Show, where they have been doing a great job breaking down the draft board position by position, like I had mentioned before. One of the great places you can find that. I did the first base episode with those guys, and it was a blast. So look back and check that out. But today we're going to ask Art to break it down by category specifically staying with the power categories, the home runs, the RBIs in your standard five by five. All right. Before we get into all that though, Art, thanks for joining us. How's it going? It's going really well. Thanks for having me. Congratulations on episode 100. I thought that was a great episode. I just listened to it the other day. Yancey giving some life wisdom there, giving some baseball As Yancey wisdom. does. <laughs> oh man, he's the best. He's the best. Congratulations on 100. We, you know what we do here? Get putting in that effort, putting in that week after week to, to keep it going. It, it, it's a labor of love and congratulations to you guys for that. Thank well, you, thank Art. You. Yeah, thank you, sir. I appreciate you taking the time to join us for our first official non-streaming triple digit episode <laughs> here as we uh, as we break things down. It's, it's easy. I won't say it's easy to get to 100, but it's easy when... You focus and we have that niche, as Yancey called it, where we're talking about the same thing every week. We're talking about fab. You know what? Whether you pay attention or not, fab happens every week. <laughs> so I figure we do too. Like we have to as well. So it was easy to stay consistent in that respect because we skip a week. If you skip a week in fab at any point in the season, you can really get behind real. We, we didn't touch on any news last week on our episode during PitchCon. So we got some stuff that we need to catch up on. I'm sure you've heard all about these things elsewhere. Or you read about them, but we're going to give you our takes of some of the, the news items that came across the desk in the last two weeks. One that happened a little bit more recently, Kevin, we're going to start in Cincinnati. They added another reclamation project. And I feel personally responsible for this one as i called this out back in october as what i wanted to see happen they signed chad pinder he leaves the a's i know he's a fan favorite in oakland regardless of his actual production he's still just a guy that everybody really liked to see play he worked really hard he liked playing there when I, from whatever i everything i heard he wanted to come back but wasn't meant to be. He probably wanted more than $1.2 million or something like that. And <laughs> the A's weren't the team that gave it to him. He signs in Cincinnati. What's your take? Can, can, can my dream of Chad Pinder being the, this year's Brandon Drury come to fruition? Or do you have some cold water you want to throw on that? I don't know about cold water because there's a lot to like here. And first be in the ballpark. We know that. So that pretty much goes without saying. He is a non-roster invitee. He will make this roster. I'm fairly certain. He float around. 
What's interesting though is for that 379 plate appearances he had in 2022 with Oakland, that was his career high. And I don't think he'll get there for Cincinnati. It's possible because he can play absolutely anywhere. And that's why he's going to make this roster and he's going to float around. He's going to get his time, but he is much better versus lefties than he is versus righties. A short side, a platoon or giving guys breaks on days when they are facing a lefty starter is probably what we're looking at. And he fits right in with our overall topic for today's episode because over a full season it would prorate out he'd be projected for 20 or more home runs a lower batting average than we would like but not absolutely horrible by today's standards that's what we're going to be looking at all episode today is these types of players (laughs) so it really boils down to Playing time, does he get more? The bat X hasn't projected for 385. I think they get those from depth charts, but ATC has him for 279, 100 plate appearances less. So there is a pretty wide range of plate appearance projection here. I think he'll get to that 300 mark. I doubt he gets to the 400 mark. So it's going to be somebody that you have to pay close attention to. We keep talking about this. How much maintenance do you want to put into your teams? But he can have value in certain spots. If daily leagues, he could be, he'll be available on the wire. You probably don't even have to keep him on your roster, pick him up and drop him all year long. So it, he's one of those players that, yeah, if he does take off like Brandon Drury did, you'll want to have him on your roster at that time because then he will get expensive as Drury did last year. But uh, yeah, it, he's going to have a place in deep league formats with the ballpark, with the probably half roughly of the playing time just because he can play all over i think he gets more than just the appearances against left-handed pitching and he's got the power like we're talking about all episode today yeah, it definitely helps he can play multiple positions you go to, over to roster resource and they already have him on the roster even though he's just the invitee and he's the only infielder on the bench or at least the only one that can play the infield you got kirk Sally who could back up first base i'm sure but you, you got to assume that Pinder would be your first choice to fill in at third, at second, and then move. You move Kevin Newman is playing shortstop, but you move somebody else over to shortstop if he needs a day off. I'm not sure Pinder would be the best bet to play short. He could play it pretty much everywhere, but I'm not sure the short would be his natural position. There's a lot of reclamation projects in Cincinnati this year, which you love to see. You like you, you love to see Colorado start doing something like this for from reclamation hitters. But Art, they can't all be winners this year can they they can't all be this year's Brandon Drury of the three that I've got listed here which one are you the most excited about or which one would you hang your hat on first as far as being the one that comes out of here on top Will Myers Jake Fraley or Chad Pender if you go by who I'm drafting the most it's Jake Fraley I'm getting him as a late outfielder on a lot of my teams because he because of the potential power speed there in that ballpark I think he could be very good. He ended the season playing well, hit 12 home runs and only 247 plate appearances last season. So over a full season, that's a pretty good pace. Will Myers is going pretty high now. He's actually going in the 240s. For me, he jumped past my 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 willingness to draft him just because of his history with injuries. So I think Fraley's my guy for this list. I've still got my fingers crossed for Pinder. I want to see that happen. I want to see my 49th round pick in my DC really work out for me. All right, let's move over to a bullpen art. We got Matt Barnes. He got DFA'd by Boston a while ago. Then somewhat recently got traded to the Miami Marlins along with his $8 million contract. I think that was the thing that I saw happen when Boston DFA'd him. If he were to just get cut, Boston would have had to hit eat up like seven and a half million or something okay. like that regardless but luckily they found a trade partner they traded him to miami now that him and that contract in the club option for next for 2024 are with the marlins does he become is that enough money that they're paying him that he becomes the closer at the back of the marlins bullpen the red sox i think are paying five million of that they're not paying all seven and a half sure. but they're paying five of it so it's cheap for the marlins i think you know him floros there floro ends the season with the job every year it seems 
So, so he's someone who I've had on a few teams already. Barnes is someone who's in the mix. I don't know how Schumacher, their new coach, is going to handle his bullpen, whether he handles it where he does one guy or a closer by committee. So I'm not confident to say that he's going to have it. Barnes has experience, but he didn't pitch very well at the beginning of last year. He ended the season pretty well, but his strikeout rate was still down, not where it was the year before and still down from his best best levels. So I, th- I for me, I'm waiting until till spring to, to wade in on this, this closing situation any further right now. I have a little bit of fluoro and I wish they just let him have it from the start of the season. Because he ends it with it, ends the season with it. He'll, <laughs> Just he's cut out the middleman. Just give it to him right cut, now. <laughs> he's going to get 10, 15 saves this year. I'm pretty sure of that. But to begin the season, I'm not sure. I think for Boston, they wanted to get rid of the walks out of their bullpen. I know that was a big motivation for Heim Bloom was to get lower walk pitchers in that bullpen. And Barnes, of course, has a terrible walk rate. So that was another motivation for them just to get him out of there as well. Yeah, that, that's probably fair as well. So maybe not a target in Fab Leagues, Kevin, but are you speculating on this bullpen now with this new wrinkle in a draft and hold league? Or maybe this is a watch list in a Fab League situation. What's your take on the Miami bullpen? I hadn't been paying much attention to it between Floro and Tanner Scott probably being the, the two guys that were there prior to this move. Now with Barnes coming in, it piqued my interest a little bit, but I just don't know. I don't think there's enough here for me to be interested in the saves I will get because I'm fairly certain, I agree with Art, I think all these guys are going to get some saves. One of these guys may take the job and end up getting a majority of the saves, but unless that's Tanner Scott, which I doubt because he talked about the walks with Barnes, Tanner Scott, even worse on that front, but he's gets the strikeouts, which would give me interest. So it's tough. I just don't think that for less than a strikeout per inning for Floro, but he has the least amount of walks. So that's the guy he's going to be out there some of the time. I just don't think I have interest here, especially with the headache. If I had a better lean on which guy I thought would take it right now. I think that probably is Barnes because he's in the middle strikeouts and walks for of the other two right smack dab in the middle, as far as projections go. So it it's, but there's just not enough there. I think I can get 10, 12 saves elsewhere and have better ratios, more strikeouts. Let me get, give you guys one question who, which bullpen do you think gets figured out first from a, from the major league side of things, not from fantasy, but like from the major league, like who become who finds themselves a closer first, Philadelphia or Miami, Kevin? Oh, that's a good one. I'm going to roll with Miami. Just be, no, excuse me. I'm going to roll with Philadelphia. Right. You caught me off guard here. Adam. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with Philadelphia. I think Kimbrell, gets the job to start and I think there's a decent chance he runs with it for quite a while and we've seen him do it before he could flop be done but I think he's going to get that chance none of these three guys for Miami have the potential to do what Kimbrell has the potential to do yeah I, the reason I asked is because you you love doing this on roster resource you go to check their bullpen and how many guys are labeled the closer <laughs> and it's yeah. not the worst like we've seen like I think San Diego last year or the year before had six guys listed as the possible closer this um, year they have closers listed as in the starting rotation for San Diego no, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> anyway Miami's only got three listed here Philly has four and I do believe those are the two Arizona has four as well do you have a preference are you targeting either one of these or which one do you think is going to clear up first I do think that Kimbrell would have wouldn't have signed with Philadelphia if he didn't have some sort of assurance that he was going to get first crack at it in spring training. I think that was probably a goal of his to be a closer. I think Kimbrell is a guy who you can draft at least expecting him to get the first save opportunity in the season. After how he pitched in LA though, I'm not sure if he's going to hold it all season. 
that's the problem with that. But yeah, so I agree. Philadelphia is more more likely. Arizona, don't even ask me. Melanson, I, I didn't want to bring yeah. it up. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to offend anybody with that. No. I, I think our hesitation, Adam, shows that unless we're desperate, we don't want to touch either one of the situations. Yeah. <laughs> something definitely keep an eye on we talk about always holding a, in a fab league holding one of those bench spot as you're rotating speculation bullpen pieces maybe these are situations that you want to speculate on with one of your last picks just so you can have that going into the season but yeah not something you need to be relying on coming out of your drafts all right kevin we're going to kansas city for two notes let's we'll start in the rotation you added to your rotation by bringing back Zach Greinke. One-year deal. My question is, is this just like a player coach type of signing where he's just the gritty vet who's coming in to help out the young guys again? A farewell contract? Or can he actually produce something to make him streamable in in most in any of our leagues? I, I think it'll be similar to last season where he will have his moments, but it's going to come without any strikeouts to speak of, which makes it really hard to use him unless you just really need a win and they have a nice matchup. That's about the only time, but he's going to be in the starting rotation for the foreseeable future unless or until some of the young guys show more development than they've showed over the past few years which is the hope with the new pitching coaching staff along with front office. Everybody's new. The The hitting coaching staff was replaced mid-season last year. Now the pitching and the manager and the front office, new GM, everything. It, the hope is some of these young guys uh, develop more than they have over the past couple of years, but until they do, and even then he is that player coach you're talking about. But right now he's in the rotation. I don't know if I would how I'd put a number on it. Roster Resource has him listed as the number one. He may get the opening day start with this presumably being his last season. Although he says if he can still pitch and if he's still feeling good, he'll keep playing, is what he's said over the last couple of days. But uh, Brady Singer's the number one on this roster in this rotation. He's right up there. Could get the opening day nod with the it is a home opener in Kansas City on opening day, so he could get the nod there. But yeah, he's probably slotted in for another 25 to 30 starts, just like he's had the last couple of seasons. Does this signing actually knock out anybody of interest from the at least the opening month rotation, Kevin? That It makes it a little interesting because we don't know, you know who that is that fifth guy was going to be it's they signed Yarbrough and Lyles. They're going to be in there. We know Brady Singer is going to be in there. Now Grinky. I think the fifth guy coming out of spring training, unless he's horrible in the spring is probably Daniel Lynch. I know roster resource has Brad Keller listed there. I think they're pretty serious about him moving to the bullpen. Like he did mid season last year. I think they would like that to stick. For that to stick, they need somebody to come into the rotation. I think that'll be Lynch to start. Then we got the guys we've been hearing about for years when they drafted them all as college players as their first five or six picks in the draft. We got Coar, we got them coming, and I think it's it probably does knock one of them out of the rotation to begin the season. But if they can figure something out, whether it's pitch mix, whether it's adding pitch, whether it's some of the stories last season about what Kansas City starting pitchers were told to do as far as sequencing and location was concerned was 20 years behind everybody that's successful in Major League Baseball right now. (laughs) So we can there might be a lot of movement early in the season, depending on how these guys adapt to the new information they're being told but for now i think it means keller's not in the rotation bubich co and any of these young guys that could turn a corner hopefully they can pop right in at some point during the season yeah kansas city has one of those off days we'll talk about this later on in the show but they do have an off day in that opening weekend so they don't need that fifth starter right away but they have a full week in the first full week of season of the game so they're going to need that fifth piece early on <clears throat> yeah second time through for sure Art, is Granke of any interest whatsoever in a draft and hold or a really deep league just for the fact that Kevin mentioned 
he's going to pitch as long as he's healthy. Mm -hmm. He's going to throw 69 and he's going to get people out somehow. It might not be by way of the strikeout, but if he's going to go and he's going to go five, six innings and give relief to that bullpen, he's going to qualify for wins whenever Kansas City's offense decides to have his back. Does he have any interest for that fact alone to you? Absolutely. I think at the back end of your drafts, you're picking mostly pitchers in those deep leagues anyways. So you're going to take a couple of stabs at potential, but you can't take all stabs at potential. You need guys who are going back there who, just, who, who throw innings, who, who, can, who you can put in when you have eight guys on the IL at midseason or in August. And Granke's perfect for that role. I just drafted him in a best ball league where I went heavy offense early and just wanted to get a bunch of innings late. I think Granke's fine for that. Now you picking his best starts that that might be the that might be tough, but the innings are going to be there, like you said. Yeah, they like <laughs> you picked him in a best ball. I think that is the right way to go, and when you're going to mm. be targeting him, Kansas City's schedule to start it off is not not pretty as far as their matchups go. The matchups they have up in opening weekend, Minnesota and Toronto. Granted, they're in Kansas City, so obviously that's going to be a little bit better. But they got to face off against San Francisco, Texas, Atlanta, Texas again. But their offense has improved over the course of the last year and a little bit in the offseason. Atlanta, the Angels, Arizona's coming up. So April will be a tough one. We'll see if how strong Greinke looks coming out of spring training and what he can do with that schedule going ahead. All right, we got a, a, two more notes to talk about. Before, before we get to those, though, we are going to take a quick break. All right, Art, we are back and I want to talk to you. I'm going to stay in a rotation here. Cole Irvin, he changes rotations. He got traded from the Oakland Athletics to the Baltimore Orioles. The move away from Oakland, from the Coliseum, from Ring Central, whatever they're calling it now, the, <laughs> the circle of death, if you will, because at one point it was falling apart. I'm sure it still is to this day. It was going to be a negative move for any pitcher because it's one of the best places to pitch with all that foul ground territory, with that big open space. But he landed in Baltimore, which has turned into not that bad of a place. Can you see this actually working in Cole's favor at all being part of the Orioles rotation instead of the A's? Yeah. If he's going to be going anywhere, but Oakland, Baltimore's a pretty good place. It's going to help at what he's weak at fly balls. It's going to hold more of those in than a lot of other parks. That's for sure. Irvin put together nine wins last season, which is very valuable. It made him and throughout the middle of the season, he was lights out at home mowing down Houston and like twice in a row mowing down good offenses in Oakland. If he can develop a little bit of comfort in Baltimore, his home starts could be valuable for streaming. I do not trust him on the road at all. And, but it's, and it's wait and see with whether or not Baltimore can really give him enough cushion, but he's a serviceable starter. He's going to throw a lot of innings for them and that's why they got him. So stream him at home, I would think. And when he's playing in Oakland, probably. Kevin, we talk about all the signings and all the additions that the A's have made to the supposed rotation. Does this make you any more interested in any of them just knowing that there's one less mouth to feed in in Oakland in that rotation? No, I'm not any more interested. It's a great ballpark. So we're always going to take a look when we're looking for streaming options. If they're at home and they're playing bad offensive lineup, especially with the matchups of handedness for a lineup for the guys going, we're going to be interested and take a look, but I don't think it matters who they are out of this group. I think we'll take a look on a week by week basis, see if they have any home games, see if we like the matchup and it really won't matter who they are. It's more about parking matchups than it is about who's in that rotation. Yeah, of course, I'm going to I'm gonna throw these out here every once in a while as PLV is debuted during PitchCon. We can actually talk about it. Cole Urban is a completely average pitcher. <laughs> I know he's got four, four pitches, which is nice. He throws in a slider every once in a while. But if you, as soon as the PLV charts are available on when PL8 launches at pitcherlist.com, you'll be able to pull him up. You'll see that his four seamer, his sinker, his curveball, and changeup are all right around league average, with two of them being slightly above and two of them being slightly below. And yeah, it's hard to get excited about it. But when a move yeah, is but made. Yeah, but as Art brought up, 
as a lefty in that ballpark with their new left field dimensions, having four average pitches is a above average pitcher, I would say. That is a fair point to make. All right, let's uh, let's finish it off here with back in Kansas City, Kevin. Aldoberto Mondesi leaves on his final year of his ar- of arbitration, gets traded to my Boston Red Sox. L- let's just talk about what it actually does to Kansas City's offense. Did it, does it make any difference whatsoever? Because he's leaving, and he's how many at bats is he really leaving behind? I'm not sure. But what's your take as far as how that, uh, at least how that infield is going to iron itself out now that Montezzi's not even in the picture? All right, we love Jason at Roster Resource, but I hope he's. I hope this means Nate Eaton is the starting third baseman Nate on Eaton opening day season. for the cast <laughs> for the Kansas City Royals. That's what I want to see. Unfortunately, he's probably right. They probably they just they gave Dozier twenty five million, so it he probably does get the shot. Even though they were trying to get him off a of third base for two years. to three years now, he's not good <laughs> defensively there. So there, it, but it does open that up. So it does give us a chance for Nate Eaton. I think with these moves that that the Royals have made, they have cleared some room for some of the younger guys. Michael Massey at second base. Nate Eaton at third base, hopefully, but Hunter Dozier and Nicky Lopez are still on the roster and they are going to play Nicky Lopez for his defense, Hunter Dozier. They've invested money and they think they still think that he can replicate what he did in 2019. Nobody here is getting the lion's share plate appearances. This is one thing I do agree completely with roster resource. The top four guys in the order, Melendez, Witt, Perez, Pasquantino, getting 550 to 650 plate appearances. Nobody else even hitting 500, except Drew Waters. I like this too, because that's what I'm hoping he's the everyday center fielder. That's still not even set. So there's all kinds of things. I hate to say this, but we really do have to pay close attention to what's going on in spring training. And then the first few weeks of the season, there's still going to be a lot of moving parts here. My hope Back to your original question, and just to reiterate it, my hope is this means regular playing time for Nate Eaton. So I, I think our, on the Boston side, I think a lot of people are, I don't know, excited is the right word when you talk about Mondesi nowadays, but is the fact that the one thing he does well when he's playing on a regular basis is steal bases. A couple of years ago, he won people leagues in the last month and a half of the season. And when he was stealing bases every other day, it seemed for six weeks straight. But as I'm looking through it, like Boston, at least in the last two years, has been in the bottom three as far as teams with aggressive tendencies on the base pass. And they just don't send anybody. And the three players that led their team in stolen bases last year will not be on the opening day roster of 2023. And that's, of course, Xander Bogarts, Trevor Story, and Jaren Duran. Duran will probably be in the minors. Story obviously is hurt. And Bogarts, we miss you. He's not going to be in a Boston uniform. Should or will Co- Alex Cora actually utilize Mondesi on the bases based on the fact that this is his only year that he may be with the Red Sox? Will they be like, we don't care? We, you didn't give up that much for you. We're going to just, we're going to drive you into the ground <laughs> until you get hurt and get and squeeze that sponge and get every drop out. Or do you foresee them being more in line with their tendencies of the last two years and just trying to get as much out of him in other areas so that he's maybe he stays on the field longer for his defense? I don't really think you can stop Mondesi from running. <laughs> You can only hope to contain him. (laughs) Yeah, he gets on base. He's going to run. I was looking it up. He's been on base under 400 times in his career. (laughs) He has 159 stolen base attempts. So it's out of every three times, he's definitely going at least once if he's on base. I don't think you can really slow him down. Granted, he did have a green light, but they're not picking him up for his defensive prowess. They're picking him up because he's a base stealer, because he's a difference maker. And if he can get his Babbitt back up and bring down the strikeouts a little bit, he could get pretty exciting, but he has to stay healthy. Yeah. He, if he, like you said, if he gets on base, he's probably going to run in the, over the last two years. And granted, it hasn't been that much of an opportunity. He's seen 121 stolen base opportunity pitches and he's run 
over 17% of the time of those pitches. And that leads baseball in the last two years with anybody with at least 120 pitches seen that fits that criteria. Right behind them, Bubba Thompson, Jorge Mateo, Dylan Moore, and Billy Hamilton, believe it or not. And then Nate Eaton rounds it out as well. So we we know who he is. We know what he can do. I guess my only question is, which one is going to win out? And you touched on that as well. I I think that Cora will utilize players to the ability that they give. I don't think that they really have had base stealers on the roster over the last two years. And the ones that have, granted, they might have been able to steal more. Story was v- not aggressive at all in the beginning of last season. Xander Bogarts is not like a speedster, but he's pretty good on the bases. Like when he's running, you just got to utilize him in the right spot. But these are the guys that led the team just because they had the opportunity to do. And so if Mondesi, yeah, I agree. They're not. He's not going to, you're not going to rely on him to hit a bunch of bombs. So you got to move him along and we got to see what this team is going to do as far as creating runs on their own. All right, guys, that's pretty much all the news. We finally got to a point where we're not like spending like the first hour and a half, Kevin, talking just about news. We only made it through 30 minutes of news this week, and that's with two weeks worth of news now. So I'm just excited for spring training to get started so we can actually talk about things that are happening on the field as news rather than signings and trades and stuff like that. Though I'm as sure long as it's them, not injuries, that yes, we're good. That's, that's, we want to know what's <laughs> happening on the field, not what's keeping people off the field. Yeah, exactly. But so we're going to talk a little bit about these power categories. So this is like our preview episode of the category, not going position by position, not going by team. We're going to go with power categories today. Home runs, RBIs were standard five by five categories is what we'll be doing throughout the episode. We'll be hitting on some speed next week, but for now it's all about the home runs and what comes with it. So let me talk to you guys about your overall thoughts on on how you're targeting power, specifically power. And we'll get into some how that the nuance of that works with the other categories, at least on the offensive side, a little bit first. Kevin, like overall thoughts on how important you think the power categories are going to be as a target in 2023 do you feel as though these are this is an area in which you're going to be focusing in a lot or do you feel like you could spread that out throughout the course of your draft yes (laughs) a little bit of both here (laughs) a little bit of both i think you know what we saw last season and hearing some other really smart people talk on other really nice podcasts about how they had issues with power last season on their teams and when we were talking about fab on a weekly basis like usually these high power, low average guys, if I need home runs and RBIs, but I'll take a hit in batting average and won't get any stolen bases. We've come to believe that those guys are a dime a dozen. And last season, they were not. They weren't there for a fairly long period in the season. Then it seemed like towards the end, they came back. There were There was more availability if that's what we were looking for. So I think it has a lot to do with the ball. And we know they use different balls, different times. Some of the motivation for that is still up in the air a little bit, I think, and we'll probably never find out. But I, I think I am operating on the assumption that we are going to have, for the most part, the deadened version of the ball that we had in 2022, which means, yes, power is a priority here. And that doesn't mean you have to get it early. It means that we have to have a plan. If our plan is working on other things earlier than guys that we can find later that provide that power, like we're going to talk about today is exactly what we need to do. Are you feel any differently going into 2023 or are you in the same boat where power is going to be a commodity that you'll be targeting? And if so, like how early in your drafts are you really going to focus on? We can, we see in like the first three rounds of mm-hmm. drafts r- right now, like all the, it, it, there's a lot of power to be had if that's where you're going to be targeting. And it averages out obviously as you go along throughout your draft, but then you, you have your, Pete Alonzo's, you have your Aaron Judges, you have these guys that are going in the first two rounds that can really help in the category. Is that something that you're targeting more so early on? Or are you treating it more like people talk about stolen bases where they like to try to get a little bit of everything from everybody throughout the course of the draft? I want a couple of strong power hitters, 30 guys who I think are going to go over 30. I don't think averaging 
20 per guy, which and I try to get, I'm aiming for 20 home run hitters. Most of my hitting draft picks, I'm trying to get guys that are going to get 15, 20 at least, but I want a couple guys who are over 30. And it's an in- interesting, if you're not going in the first round in the top of the second round, there's only a few guys you think you can say, this guy is a pretty good shot of hitting 30. By the time pick 25 is out, we got Machado, Tatis, Alonzo, Devers, Riley, Trout, Goldschmidt go between 15 and 25. All the, all that power is gone and not to mention Judge and all that. So to me, I'm thinking I like to get someone in the first two or three rounds, if I can, that I feel is a pretty good power hitter because I did have trouble, as Kevin was saying, the waiver wire was not forgiving last year. And it was received knowledge that you can always get power on the waiver wire. Last season, that wasn't the case anymore. I think I'm making a more concerted effort to pick it up, but I'm not making sure to not over-focus on it because I don't want to get to the end of my draft and I'm trying to find speed at the end of my draft because I I think that's a nightmare. I'm just trying to find at-bats, really, mm-hmm. when, it, <laughs> when it comes down at the end. So if you're trying to get, or you talked about trying to get those guys that are getting over 30 home runs, and of course the RBIs will follow along with that in most cases, are you focusing on specific positions in which you feel the power should be coming from, or the ones that maybe are a little bit more difficult to get the power from later on? Would you rather get, say, a shortstop, that can get you 30 home runs or would you rather get a corner a first baseman or even a third baseman that can get you 40 home runs knowing that maybe that's typically where the power would normally come from do you focus on the position or is it just about the total definitely with first base it's hard for me to get a guy who's not going to be getting 25 plus home runs because so there are so many of them at first base so you got you got your pick at different points during the draft of which of those guys you want to go after So first base is a position that I'm looking for power, and a couple of my outfielders have to have power. Third base as well, unless I don't think I'm going to go after a guy like Cabrian Hayes to get some speed out of third base. If I get the first pick and I get Jose Ramirez, great. Otherwise, I'm not really worried about third base speed. I want some power. I'm loving Austin Riley. If I can get in that range of the draft, I'm loving him there. Yeah, I'm trying to get it from first, third, and a couple outfielders. Fair enough. So not a focus maybe in the middle part of your infield. Kevin, do you feel a little bit differently than that? It's because it's not, I think the other side of the coin is that because it's not something you normally could find power in the middle infield, does that become a stronger commodity to you if you can work that into your draft strategy? It really depends. That's such a cop-out answer, but it does. It really depends on where you're going at, and what you've done so far in the draft. I mean, I, it, you can build around just about anyone, right? Any, anybody that that is going to be drafted in the earlier rounds, you can figure out a way to to build around that i think that now that we know and it's not just that we know it, it's the players know what no saris had talked about he talked to tommy fam tommy fam knows these balls aren't traveling as well as definitely 2019 and some mm-hmm. others in the past have traveled and so he needs to pull the ball more players know this too they're going to be making adjustments as well so I, I don't want to concentrate on it too much in the aspect of, oh, we couldn't find any power last year and I, I overreact to it. I think that we can look at the totals from last year and the number of home runs that we needed in our leagues came down. And I think we can make those adjustments and just be cognizant of what's going on with our team if you draft Luis Arias for a batting average boost and some runs because you think he's going to be at the top of the lineup as one of your middle infielders then you better have those home runs on the corner as Art said or from the outfield and additional to <laughs> than what you would normally have with somebody that's going to hit 15 to 20 home runs in that spot because he's probably not going to it's it sounds like such a cop out, but it really depends on what you're doing with the rest of your draft. Yeah. Or on triple play, when we did first base, I talked mm-hmm. about this a little bit. I'm like, I'm not expecting to get stolen bases out of my first baseman. So it's not the focus. So that's that goes into this kind of this overall question about like how are we looking to 
focus on the categories based on the position in which you're bringing in. And I think a lot of people do have that mentality where it's like, all right, I don't need to get stolen bases out of my corner because all the stolen bases are in the middle infield or in the outfield. It powers the same way. I, Kevin, I'll echo exactly what you said. It's like, it really depends on how you're building your roster. And that really shouldn't be the focus in my mind. And I know I said that on your guys' show, like, the categories can come from where they're going to come. Don't worry right. about what position it is. I'm like, oh, I need to get X amount of power from my first baseman because that's just what first basemen do, right? That's what a good first baseman does. Power, you just, the total number at the end of the season is what matters, not where it comes from, per se. It's, I think a lot of people devalue your utility spot in your lineup, in your corner, in your middle. It's, oh, that's just where you throw your backup first baseman or your backup third baseman or whatever. It's still a position on your fantasy roster. If you, in your draft, if you find a way to double tap third baseman because that's just what makes sense, that person's going to give you the same amount of stats in your corner than than if they were starting in your third base. I'm just saying, make sure that you realize what your roster is supposed, it can look like. And every roster spot is just as valuable as the last. We talk about like the idea of the dead and ball, the possible dead and ball. What have you, we're never going to see 2019 again, at least not for a while. We expect to be something a little bit closer to 2021 and last year, Kevin, but speed is still a thing and it's still something that we're not going to focus on that much in this episode. But as you're drafting, especially in the first 10 rounds, it's still something that everybody is going to be talking about. They're going to be targeting because you want a well-rounded roster. You want to be able to compete in all five of the hitting categories. There's a line like there are guys who can they can hit 50 home runs and steal zero bases that give you nothing in that category. How much power do you need that to completely forget about the fact that they're not going to contribute in another category like stolen bases? Off the top of my head, 30 home runs just pops right in my mind. Once I get to 30 home runs, especially with a decent batting average, I, I can I can worry about getting my stolen bases elsewhere. Typically, I just if, when it comes down to it, there's going to be a lot of decisions we make during a draft. And when it comes down to a guy projected for 35 home runs and zero or one stolen base. They like to give them just one right on the projections <laughs> versus a guy with 30 home runs and four stolen bases. Those four stolen bases, I think make up for the four or five home runs. I really do because it doesn't take a whole lot of guys that one of them that's projected for six stolen bases spikes in 11 we get Kyle Schwarber from last season that was amazing that was a huge help for teams that they probably didn't even realize it was happening at the time so anytime that there's a handful with a couple of less home runs I'm gonna lean that way but when you're talking 30 plus home runs then it's I can find speed other places Schwarber won the won the country free tacos in the World That's Series. Right. He stole that, but he said he's done doing. I'm like, I'm gonna I'm gonna give everybody tacos. Usually it's Mookie Betts doing that, and he, I think Mookie Betts did like three years in a row because <laughs> with time of winning in, with the Red Sox and obviously being in the World Series with the Dodgers as well. Um, so let's not shortchange Kyle Schwarber's ability to steal bases, especially when there's tacos on the line. You have Vladito going out and stealing. He had a string of five games where he stole like seven bases. I'm being facetious. It was something similar to that though. I felt like it was like every day for three days straight. And all of a sudden you, that little ticker that the bot on, on Twitter, that probably is going to be too expensive to run now. And it probably, we probably won't see it next year. All of a sudden, Vlad's coming up every day on that ticker. It was amazing. So yes, stolen bases can come out of nowhere, especially with the new rules that are coming out and everybody's talking about them. No one actually knows what it's going to happen with them. So I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, because of the new rules, we're going to see X and Y and Z. But it's something obviously on everybody's mind are is, do you think, in your opinion, do you think the new rules are going to spread out stolen bases enough where they don't they're not going to be as much of a commodity in drafts and thus along with the possible or probable dead end ball make power home runs specifically more important to be targeting in drafts not so much switching the way we've been seeing stolen bases being push pushing people up but do you think that power could actually push people up like Pete I keep going back to Pete Alonso because he could hit 50 home runs as easily as judged could and he's going in the middle to the er, maybe the early second round could that idea bump him up or his type of player up 
another round and we start seeing Pete Alonso going in the same breath as Vlad and Freeman as far as first baseman go in the at the end of the first round. Oh, okay. I think that no, this is what I'm talking about here. With Pete Alonso, we're not expecting any stolen bases, even with the rules changes. I don't think. Maybe he's gonna go to the to management and say, Hey, with these bigger bases and they're closer together in the pitch clock, I can steal a few bases. I doubt it. So that it does make a difference. You got Pete Alonzo and Matt Olson in the top five first baseman. Everybody else steals some bases. And I'm including Vlad Jr. in that. Freeman, we know. Goldschmidt, we know. And then we drop back down a ways again. So, yeah, I think it, I think it is something to consider. But as you said, Pete Alonzo can. He definitely within the realm of possibilities that he could hit 50 home runs. 40 plus, is, I would say, is almost likely with a full healthy season. So that's where you start making that choice. We're not just talking maybe a handful of home runs. We're talking 10 to 20 more home runs for a guy that doesn't steal bases. It really boils down. And this is a decision that partly is going to be made for you by where you are drafting in the first round. So mm -hmm. who's going to be available and who you're going to take. And then you have to decide what your comfort level is. Do I want Pete Alonzo and I have to chase stolen bases the rest of the draft? Or do I want Paul Goldschmidt and I may be lacking in a little bit of power? Not specifically from Paul Goldschmidt, but overall as a team, I'm not going to have those extra that, that Pete Alonzo is going to give me. So it's really intriguing in it. And I think a lot of that is something that is decided for us when our when we get our draft position. All right, do you have a take on this as far as pushing up power for the sake of pushing out power mm -hmm. and knowing that maybe stolen bases are going to become a little bit more plentiful, a little bit easier? Maybe. We don't know. I'm making stuff up as I go. How are you looking at this going into drafts? Or how have you been tackling this in the drafts you've already completed? So one of the things I've been thinking about is exactly what Kevin was talking about, depending on when you draft Really, like a guy like Alonzo, like Austin Riley, who I consider the Pete Alonzo of third base, like that premier power bat for the position. You're If you're not picking in the late teens, if you're not picking in the early 20s, you're not going to get these guys. For me, I'm, I think that with stolen bases, I think there is going to be an increase in stolen bases. I think that's part of the point. There's four, it's four inches less that, that are cut off by the increased bases. And four inches makes a difference in a lot of people who are thrown out. But as I was saying, I don't think that's going to make it much more appealing to Pete Alonso, the four inches. But as a lot of people are saying, they're guessing people who might go from five to 10. And I think if, if there are more of those, yes, then the power becomes a greater, a scarcer commodity because there are just more stolen bases to get. And because of that, I'm going after Riley late and then another first baseman. This is why I'm targeting first baseman. I'm targeting a first baseman late that I think has a chance for 30. And there are a lot of those as you go out through, throughout the draft. So that way I can go after guys who I think have a better chance to get more stolen bases than like Goldschmidt early. And I think I, I tend to agree. I think I will be in my drafts moving forward. It's not something I think I focused on in my drafts I've already completed, but it will be something as we uh, kick off our uh, fifth and sixth listener leagues, Kevin, those who are listening before those drafts kick off, they can, they'll know that I'll probably be focusing a lot on the power categories, at least in the first like 10 rounds of my draft. In addition to everything else, because you have to build an entire roster that not your pitchers aren't going to be hitting home runs. So something just to consider. All right, let's talk about we, I think we've done enough to push Je Zef Zimmerman from listening to any of this episode because we've talked enough of about the first two or three rounds. And so we're going to move on to the players that we can get at the very end of our drafts, especially our 12 teamers, players that might even be on the wire come the first week of fab. And we're going to do that right after this quick break. All right, we are back. You are still listening to On The Wire. I am Adam Howe, joined by Kevin Hastings. And we are lucky to be joined by Art Tornabine of Triple Play Fantasy Baseball. And we are going to 
break down some power options, at least uh, some suggestions to look at maybe with your final five picks of a 12 team draft, 30 rounds. We're looking, we're basing this around the online championships that have kicked off within the last month or two on the NFBC platform, 30 rounds. So obviously the 30 man rosters, we've got five outfielders, all that, all that good stuff. Anybody listening to this is probably well aware of what a roster looks like on NFBC at this point. These are also the same format as our listener leagues as well. Um, So the rules of this little game that I had you guys fill out, I want you to look for players that are going at an ADP of 325 or later in the most recent online championships that have concluded within the last month. So there's been nine at at the time of this, of this recording, preferably you're focusing on guys that were not drafted in all nine. And I think anybody with the ADP of 325 or lower actually has not, there's nobody in that list that has been drafted in all nine of those drafts. So it was an easy rule to, to abide by. And you only care about home runs and RBIs. You do not care about average. You don't care about runs, stolen bases. None of that matters in this scenario. These are players that we're looking at that could help you in the very first one or two weeks of the season. You would have no problem dropping them after that, just so you could get a little bit of a bump in home runs, RBIs, maybe you're slacking on it in your draft and you feel like, you know what, I'm going to have to stream home runs at the early going until I find somebody that sticks. These are the guys you might be want to look at, at least for, for April matchups. So broke it down by corner infielders, middle infielders available, and outfielders. So each one of us took at least one player in each category. As the guest here, I'm going to let you pick which one you want to talk about first, whatever you want to go with, and let us know kind of where they're going, where they might be able to get drafted if they even have to draft them. Maybe they can just wait until their first week of fab. But if you want to save some fab money, draft them in your 30th round. That's good too. And why you might be looking at this guy to to add some, maybe an extra home run or two in the first week of the season yeah i was thinking about this as like 30th round draft picks that's what i was trying to look for and the first guy i want to talk about is spencer steer from the cincinnati reds now steer is a guy who you might come to april if you draft him in the 30th round and he might not be on the opening day roster if he has a terrible spring so that that's the downside of this you have to have that sort of constitution in you to take him and be like, eh, it's a 30th round draft pick anyways. You're you're going to be replacing five or six people off of your draft in the first fab period anyways, or if you're lucky, less than that. But I like Steer. They want to give him a long look. And Cincinnati, we were just talking about it. They don't have a lot of backup infielders to, to play there. They've reported to, that they want to give him the first chance. It's possible Pinder is the guy who would be backing him up at third base. They don't have a lot of other backup infielders. And they play their young guys. And his profile is pull the ball in the air. And that's how home runs are hit. And he hit 24 home runs in 2021 in minor leagues at two levels, 25 in 2022 in three levels. He's got a power stroke. I think he's going to get first chance. And he plays in a band box. He plays in Cincinnati. So there's nothing nothing to dislike there. And I think one of the reasons they were feel comfortable getting rid of a guy like Moustakis is because they felt like they wanted to give Steer, clear the path for him, give him a chance to take it. Moustakis hasn't signed anywhere, huh? He's still out there. That's too bad. I always liked Mike Moustakis. Whether or not he would actually play on the field or not is another, and nowadays is a different question, but now he doesn't even have an opportunity. That's right. He got paid. It's fine. Steer is a is an interesting one. It fits in the mold of somebody else we're going to talk about in a little bit. But your point about this might be a guy you drop in the first fab period is completely valid. And it's fine. It's my favorite part of drafting these fab leagues back in November or December, knowing I've got that out, knowing I have the ability to completely wreck my entire roster, at least half my roster in the first week of fab. Want to put yourself in that situation, but you do give yourself an opportunity to take a couple of risks here or there and steer along with Matt Mervis, who I'm going to bring up in a second. They're little mini lottery tickets, especially as people start wondering whether or not they're going to make the roster and they start, they start moving down draft boards and they become, you get the ability to pick them up with your 30th pick in a third in a 12 team draft. So I like that call out Cincinnati, of course, it's been one of the best hitting parks in on a three year rolling average. It's on top for all three on the stat cast park factors for both handed for right handers, left handed doesn't matter there. It's at the top. It was at the top of left handed park factors 
for home runs specifically just last year. And it was right behind Colorado and right-handed for right-handed hitters. So you got to love the place he's playing and who he's going to be hitting against as well as still the NL Central. And it's still a somewhat balanced, unbalanced schedule. It's not as unbalanced as it was before, but he's still going to get plenty of at-bats against NL Central teams pitching. I- I'm just going to go right into Matt Mervis was one of the guys I wanted to call out. Kevin, you have him penciled on your list as well. And really the only reason I want to call him out is exactly in the same vein that you're talking about with Steers. Like, he his ADP has been plummeting ever as as much as it was skyrocketing in October and November when everybody was out in Arizona seeing him hit bombs, seeing him hit 36 home runs last year in the minors and just destroying baseballs as as much as it went up then it's been going equally down ever since Eric Hosmer and Trey Mancini. Bye bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> this is a buying opportunity for sure. He yeah. it doesn't fit the mold as far as like you might he might not be on the opening day roster. Mm-hmm. That's still a very strong possibility. He has to impress quite a bit, I think, in spring training to knock out anybody, even Eric Hosmer, at least for opening day. So he might not be able to be that streamer that you want to, but he's not the kind of guy you draft to be a streamer. He's a guy, he's a stash, simple as that. And then as soon as he is up, they're not going to call him, in my opinion, not going to call him up to play every other day. They're, if he's good enough to play, he's good enough to play every day in Chicago. The other corner that I wanted to call out, also on your list, Kevin. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna lean on you to echo any th- any interest here. Carlos Santana of Pittsburgh. He was drafted in just one of the last nine online championships. So he is available in pretty much every fab and week one fab. He was also picked with the uh, Mr. Irrelevant pick, the very last pick in that online championship in which he was drafted in. I just want to call the fact that Pittsburgh hasn't been that bad of a place to hit. I think it has a, an, I think there's an idea out there that the that PNC park is a very pitcher friendly park and it's not wrong per se, but at least for left hand hitters and of course Santana switch hitter. So he'll hit lefty every once in a while. It wasn't top 10 for home runs for left handed hitters. So something to just consider there. But the fact is that Pittsburgh plays their first three games in Cincinnati. So that is not going to be a bad thing to look at. Then they travel for three games in Fenway park, which also one of the top hitting parks in all of baseball. For right-handers, it was the third best home run hitting park last year. And then they play, and then they go into into Pittsburgh, they play the White Sox. Something to consider, he's going to be playing every single day. It's what he does. He slugs baseballs. It's what he was signed to do. He's going to be playing either DH. He might get some time at first base, but I would expect him to be the Pirates every day. DH, and he's just... He's going to knock baseballs over the fence and that's what you get him for. And I have no problem dropping him as soon as I don't need him or I find myself keeping him on my bench for more than two rotations, then it's an easy drop. Kevin, what did, what else did you see about Santana that had you interested in for, with the final pick if you really need the power? No, everything you just said, in addition to that, he's going to hit in the middle third of the lineup. Roster resource has him at six right now. He could probably end up anywhere between fourth and seventh. But the guys in front of him, O'Neal Cruz, Brian Reynolds, Cabrian Hayes, G-Man Choi, Andrew McCutcheon, all of those guys get on base at a 320 or higher clip or are projected to a couple of them at a 350 clip. We're not just talking home runs here. We're also talking RBI and as crazy as it may sound, it's the Pittsburgh pirates, but uh, Carlos Santana could be in line for a lot of RBI. Yeah. Still had the 60th best hard contact percentage in all of baseball last year. That's also a crazy stat to think about where he's at in his career at his age at this point. So that could translate as well, hopefully. Kevin, any other corner infielders besides uh, Mervis, Santana, and Steer that you might be thinking could add some power in the first week of the season or so, or beyond? Yeah, I have a few, so I'll go over them really quickly. Wilmer Flores, all these guys are projected for, in, in a full season worth of plate appearances, would be projected for over 20 home runs. Right. Wilmer Flores had over 600 plate appearances last season. I don't think he'll have that again, but I think he'll have over 500. We know he can play everywhere for the Giants, and they are willing to use him in any matchup because he can move around the diamond so well. They don't just use him on the strong side of his platoon. Jared Walsh, only in a fab league will I take him because we have no idea what's going on with his health. If his health returns, right, he's a 30 home run hitter. 
in a really good Angels lineup now, and we've all forgotten about him. So this is just, a, we should know more by the end of March drafts. But until then, I'm taking it at the end of drafts in Fab Leagues to, to see what happens. We can always let him go later. Brandon Belt, shocked, still qualifies after signing with Toronto. We keep hearing about Alejandro Kirk and Danny Jansen, one of them getting DH at bats. They are good hitters for catchers. They're not better hitters than Brandon Belt. Okay, Brandon Belt will DH against right-handed pitchers and probably more often than that. So as long as he's healthy. Speaking of health again, Fran Mel Reyes. Was it? Yeah, signs I feel first. like I feel like he was banged up last year, had a lot to do with some of his issues, and he came around when he first signed with the Cubs. Then he fell off there too, got sent to the minor leagues. And right, right now he is a free agent. And depending on where he ends up signing, if it is in major league baseball, then that will pique my interest. It'll be yeah, worth weird. He's a minor eye league free agent. Right. That's even stranger. Absolutely. My favorite, and I listed him under corner infielders. He's the only to start this. Derek Hall is probably the designated hitter in a very potent Philadelphia Phillies lineup until Bryce Harper comes back, at least against righties. He has a lot of power. And in that lineup, he's my favorite of this group. You'll have to have a plan. When Harper comes back, Harper's probably going to DH for a while. That means Hall's done. But for the first two to three months of the season, maybe longer, depending on how Bryce Harper's rehab goes, we're looking at a strong side of a platoon DH with a ton of power. And that Philly, that Phil, Philly ballpark is also nothing to sneeze at as far as one that can generate home runs and power in general. Paul has not been drafted in an OC. No, he is still wide open and still available. And he'll be a very popular pickup if, if and when spring training comes around and he's doing stuff. The Phillies have announced, make an announcement about what, where he's been playing. Both we checking out Mike Curlin's lineup tracker. We'll be watching how the Philly is actually using him in spring training and how often he's playing. You want to see him start a couple games at first base just for fun. Sure. That'd be fine. Spring training games don't matter. Just see, get him, get his feet wet there. So he can get a little bit more playing time throughout the course of the season. But I like the call out there for sure. Especially if you want power, if Hall's playing every day, he's the guy that's going to. They only you gave him 12 plate run. appearances against lefties last season. So I doubt it's every day, but he'll get the a, a big share. Also, too early to come to see what the rotations are that they're going to be facing in the first week or two. But if you really wanted to get ahead of yourselves, go ahead and at least double check to see what the projected rotations are of and see what those matchups are. You're facing a righty heavy rotation. There you go. That's something to keep an eye out for. All right, let's move to over to the middle infield. Our got a guy on here that I'm interested to hear your takes on. And I've heard him. Christopher Weber talks about him is one of his big boy hit ball hard guys on in the deep. So talk to me about Isaac Paredes. He does what you want a hitter to do to get home runs. He hits fly balls. He pulls fly balls. Every single one of his home runs, 20 home runs and 331 plate appearances last year were pulled into the left field seats. Most of them were right down the line. It's what he's trying to do. And and even Tampa can't stop him. Even Tampa can't hold him in. He just needs to pull him down the line. One of the reasons why I really like him actually, besides the fact that he's going for home runs with the home run swing, is that he also has a really good elite zone contact rate as well. So he I think that he's in line to get late appearances most days of the week in Tampa as well. So I think he's someone who could get best his 330 plate appearances from last season by quite a bit. And and with the way he hits, with that it's a good zone contact rate, I see his batting average coming up over the course of the season. And I think he's just going to hit home runs because, yeah, he pulls fly balls. In this day and age, you want to be able to pull your fly balls for home runs. Simple as that. Oppo tacos are not something that are as common as we might have seen in the past. Opposite field is where fly, home, fly balls go to die in this day and age, especially with the ball. So I like the call out there And as far as what he does on the field. All right. I, this was tough for me as far as middle infielders go. We kind of alluded to it earlier, but like the middle infield is not where you're looking to get your power from typically maybe early on in the draft so later on i got i'm gonna go with stick with the pirates of all places go with rodolfo castro he's adp of 358 he was drafting just three of the last nine ocs and i'm 
I'm trying to pull up what, what had me interested in him in general, besides the fact that he's both second base and third base eligible. So he's eligible in a lot of different positions. He gives you a little bit more flexibility. I've already drafted him at least two or three different places for that reason alone, if not just the idea that he will be playing every day, second base for the Pirates. Like Kevin said about Santana, he's probably in the top four of that lineup as well, giving him the ability to do his strikeouts. Sure, that's an issue. Hopefully he can get through that. I don't necessarily care in a short stint how many strikeouts he has as long as he peppers in a couple of home runs along with. And as I pull up the PLV rolling charts that we have over at Pitcher List as far as for the hitter side, that his decision making throughout the course of last season was right around Major League average just slightly below that so he's making pretty much he can make he could learn from that and he can make better decisions next year as far as what pitches he's swinging at and making contact at but when it comes to the power and he was right there at league average as well but for the most of the season if you look at his rolling chart he was in right around the 75th percentile as in all of baseball so he he has that ability he has he can take the pitches that he's given as deep as 75 percent of the league can at least in his short stint in the majors so far so i do the idea of rodolfo castro being able to take advantage of the opportunity the pirates are actually going to give him and give me hopefully one or two home runs in the first two weeks of the season and not necessarily hurt me anywhere else. Also giving me flexibility. This is not somebody I think I will be constantly targeting in the rest of my drafts. I think I have enough exposure to him right now, but I will be ha- feel like I will be happy with him, especially in a 15-teamer for what he can do. The 12-teamer, he'll be somebody that I'm jumping in and out of my lineup throughout the course of the season. And with that schedule, I said what the Pirates had early on in the season, with three games in Cincinnati, three games in Boston to start off, it's not a bad place to stream a guy like Castro. Kevin, middle infield, who's getting who's giving you some power from the middle infield to start the year? I got a couple here. Oh, one, because you didn't put catchers on here. I, I did used that them per- as a middle <laughs> infield. They are part of your mi- up the middle defense. Mike Zanino, I just think he's going to get the plate appearances in Cleveland, at least half, may- maybe a little more. And when he plays, he hits home runs. It's going to be a sub 200 batting average, unfortunately. <laughs> but we know all about Mike Zanino. But I think he's going to get playing time in Cleveland. And then my guy from about the midpoint of last season to the end, I kept talking about Ramon Urias in Baltimore qualifies at both shortstop and third base. And he he could pop 20 plus home runs with regular playing time. It took him a while to get going last season. He was one of the guys that we were on due to the hard contact percentage. And that played out for us. He continued, he began to, hit for more power as the season progressed even as a right-handed hitter with the new dimensions in Baltimore he hit some shots that way cleared that new left field fence out there so it was cool to see monster power when he does get a hold of one and yeah everybody knows I like Ramon Arias him and Zanino <laughs> yeah. middle infield for me I almost put him on my list, but I'm like, ah, there's no way Kevin doesn't put him on the list. You know what? Something about Isak Paredes. So we talked last week with Yancey about when you hear something from people, do you just accept it blindly? But maybe not necessarily. But when you hear it from Eno Saris and James Anderson and Art now, I think that's three really smart people all on the same player who we forget is still only 23 years old and was a top yeah. prospect when he was with yeah. Detroit. Yeah. I love that call. Yeah. Pretty grades out on the PLV charts. You can see where they all going to grade out on a 20 to 80 scale. Got a 45 grade power, but a 60 grade contact, a 65 grade decision value. So this is a guy who he needs to be more aggressive. He's well below average as far as like knowing what pitch to actually that he knows what he can do with it. He's letting pitches go by that he should be able to do stuff with. And he's, if he can take advantage of that a little bit more next year, that will translate for sure with a 7.1 with zero being average. You just take my word for it. It's pretty, it's on the low side. He needs to be a little bit more aggressive at the plate to take advantage of that pull heavy approach. As you mentioned, Art. All right, Kevin, I'm going to stick with you as going into outfield because you got some really good guys that really uh, pop on this PLV chart that I and that I've been referencing a lot. So why don't you get into your outfield choices here and who can knock some balls over the fence? 
Yeah, I went with a few guys here as well, and a couple of them are pretty obvious. We know what they can do with the bat when they play. I like Duvall. I, as, as long as it continues to appear that he's going to be the center fielder in Boston, he will end up on, on, on my fantasy teams. If he's going to play, I like him a lot. Joey Gallo, we know the batting average hit. We know the risk of a huge batting average hit. In OBP leagues, he's amazing. He can still pop a 350 OBP for a season, as many walks as he takes. Uh, completely different player there, obviously, but I think the home runs will be there in Minnesota. It was interesting to me when you when we first came up with this outline, I ran a quick just auction calculator and then sorted by just the home runs. Only Four players, only four players were at zero dollars or above for home runs. Now, playing time can play into that, right? But sure. only four players that were going that qualify for your categories here. And we already talked about Matt Mervis. I just brought up Adam Duvall and Joey Gallo. The fourth one is Tyrone Taylor. So that was really interesting to me. ATC has him projected for 472 at bats. 234 batting average, a little higher than a lot of these guys that we're talking about, and 19 home runs in less than 500 plate appearances. So that was really interesting. We know that On the Wire loves Matt Carpenter. I think he's going to get more playing time than some others realize. That kind of speaks for itself. It's all about what you think the playing time he's going to get. And then, once again, playing time. And I poo-pooed this guy when we talked about him earlier in the offseason because I have thought about him as a short side platoon guy for a long time, and that has not been the case recently. If the Dodgers are going to run Trace Thompson out there most days in center field, then we need to start paying more attention to him. And he is being I, – where's my notes, Adam? What would you do with them? So he's been taken as high as 317. And as late as 317, because he's only been picked once in these nine online championships we're talking about at pick 317. He's only projected for 344 plate appearances. Every day we get closer to spring training, it appears that we're probably going to get about 50% more than that minimum. Now, the batting average, 222 is what ATC hasn't projected for. But 18 home runs, and I'm talking about possibly 50% more playing time, we're pushing 30. And then we're talking over 70 RBI, over 60 runs scored, and he's a non-zero in stolen bases like we talked about earlier in the show. Get everybody you can that'll get a handful, and this year that could possibly be 10. Like I said, I poo-pooed this early in the offseason, but every day that goes by and the Dodgers don't do something else with center field, Trace Thompson becomes more and more appealing. Trace Thompson, by far, not, not by far, probably by far, is my favorite name on this whole list. Only be, if for no other reason, he pops on like every other kind of search that I've been, that I've been doing. Besides the fact that, yeah, the, like you said, the longer we go, the more likely it is that he's going to get close to, if not everyday playing time. And, you know, what he could, I know you poo, yeah, I remember you poo-pooed on him earlier in the offseason when we were talking about the situation. Like, well, I can't believe that Tampa Bay is going to rely on him. They barely rely on him. I had him. always thought on him yeah. as a short side platoon right. guy. He's got reverse splits. But we know how long it takes for reverse splits that Yeah, but it's for his career, they show up as well. That's fair. All right. In these PLV charts, there are six guys who got a 80 grade power grade from through the 2022 season. And in no particular order, we've got Aaron Judge. We got Jordan Alvarez. Nobody's surprised by any of this. Mike Trout. Kyle Schwarber's on the list. One guy that I'm surprised only because he's on this list that nobody brought up is Kesson Hira. Oh. And then the sixth person on this list, again, in no particular order, is Trace Thompson. He's also got a 70 grade decision value, so he's making the right decisions. He just needs to make more of them because he also fits in that Isaac Paredes bucket of not being very aggressive, five point negative five point six percent less aggressive than the rest of the league when it comes to pitches that should be swung on as PLV measures. And so, yeah, I love this call out. He can definitely, if he increases that aggressiveness at the plate, he can tap into the power that he's shown he has on the pitches that he's given. He just needs to do it more often. He can easily hit that eighteen plus twenty home run plus power. Kevin, that you're talking about. And on top of that, 
the Dodgers have four games in an opening weekend. So there are 10 games. There are 10 teams. There's five series that go all four. They go Thursday to Sunday in that first week. And so you want to take advantage of that playing time that you can. Dodgers are, are hosting Arizona. San Diego hosts Colorado. Miami will host the Mets. Seattle hosts Cleveland. And Houston will ho- be hosting the White Sox. They have the, on- the only five series that get four games that opening weekend. On top of that, we'll be hitting on this more when we hit our opportunity episode. But it is something to note. If you more plate appearances, more opportunities to hit home runs. Miami, the Mets, and Houston all have eight straight games of games. So they've got more opportunities from those three teams in the first week and a half of the season to hit more home runs. And we really haven't picked anybody from any of these teams because they're all being drafted, really, when it comes down to it. I'm going to go ahead. I was very reluctantly going to highlight Marcel Orzuna, who's still going at an ADP of 339. So he just made the cut of the rule of 325 or higher. Only drafted in six out of the last nine OCs. Probably going to be batting in the bottom third or so of the order in Atlanta. Still in Atlanta. (laughs) Atlanta has one of those lineups where it almost doesn't matter where you hit them. You're still going to have the opportunity to knock in runs. Ozuna still has shown with even all of his knucklehead moves is that's the PG version of that. What I will call here on this show. He still show that he can hit the ball. He will continue to hit the ball. I can pull up had his sheet. I had his page up just a second ago. There it is. Another one that is in the, the high percentile range, hard contact rate last year, even with the time missed, he was able to put that up, keep that percentage high enough. I don't really want to spend a lot of time talking about Marcelo Zuna. I'm going to simple as that, but he is going to be available. He has something that he probably needs to hit in order to stay not only in the lineup, but maybe even on the roster in Atlanta. He needs to, you need to weigh his production on the field above what he's done off the field to, for Atlanta brass to justify not making a move on him earlier. And so he may have something to chip on his shoulder to take advantage of that. So that's what you're looking for. He's available. And there's something to look, I almost picked Andrew McCutcheon just because I wanted to go three for three on pirates, but I ended up trying to stick away from Pittsburgh here. Art, take us home. Who in the outfield are you looking at to maybe hit a couple home runs, knock in some runs in the first week or so of the season? I got some Marlins for you right here, actually. Oh, there we uh, go. <laughs> yeah. I just remembered a corner infielder, Garrett Cooper. For the Marlins, he's going to be hitting. I, I don't know where he's going. I'm guessing he's he'll he's in this range, but he ended the season strong. And the guy who he's battling for possibly hitting fourth or fifth, it's going to be Garrett Cooper or, or Avisel Garcia. Now, no one is excited to draft Avisel Garcia after last season. I'm telling you, he's going to be last season's tra- trash. This season's treasure. Craig Mish on the fantasy baseball beat on Triple Play. Came on and said, Avi came on. He was out of shape. He came into camp, didn't look good. And you saw it in the results. His launch angle went down, down at the lowest point of his career. Batting average stunk, didn't hit for power. Now, this is why in this specific instance, him coming in shape and all the talk about him being in shape to me does make a difference because last season he was known to be out of shape. And I know, and he was feeling bad about that big contract for the Marlins. They don't sign $50 million contracts. So first season there, this is his second season there. He's in shape. He's going to be hitting well fourth or fifth in that lineup. And they have eight straight days of games to open the season. So I think he's going to be getting a lot of appearances there and coming into camp in shape. I think he's going to experience a good little bounce back season. Yeah, I mean, I think that's important to look at the fact that how much opportunity somebody is going to get early in the season. We talk about it all season long, Kevin. Like you can stream anything at any time. And if you see that in your draft, oh, you know what? Unless I like find a diamond in the rough in the first third of the season, I'm going to be struggling for power. You need to start that right away. Start right away. It, it does more help than it does harm, in my opinion, is when you're streaming early on for the specific categories. We talk about looking at the categories that you need to focus on come the all-star break or as your league mates are either falling off or falling in, you can see where you can make up the most ground. Get ahead of it. That's what we're talking about here with these preview pods. Get ahead of it. Look at the guys that are going to be available in the first week of fab. 
get after in your last two picks of your draft. Save yourself some money. But I think we hit on any, anything else to add on Garcia, Kevin, or anybody else that we talked about that kind of popped in your head? No, just to reiterate what Art brought up, once again, I think I keep bringing his name up, but I heard him talk about this as well. Eno Saris was talking about how he has had a bad year every time he signed a new contract and then bounces back. So the coming in out of shape for him wasn't a surprise, and he doesn't expect it to continue this season. He's done this before. So uh, another reason to like him. There you go. Yeah, n- it's never a bad thing to quote Saris. Typically, <laughs> don't feel bad for that. He, um, yeah, he likes a lot of the players we were talking about this week. Yeah. <laughs> all right. On top of all of this, Kevin, is there anything else that you can kind of leave everybody with as far as what they should be thinking about as they're drafting, as we're heading into February and spring training's right around the corner? Yeah, you started talking about the schedule a little bit this week, and you will more and more as we go on. And I had dove a little deeper into the beginning of the season's schedule. But before I saw that you were talking about the, you brought up the teams that are playing four games the opening weekend of the season. All 30 teams play on March 30th. 10 teams then play three games for the weekend. I'm breaking this down for NFBC format now where we can Mm -hmm. change our lineups on Friday. Four teams have a seven-game week the first full week of the season. Atlanta, Washington, Kansas City, Toronto. Okay? But 10 more teams have their off day on Friday that week. So we'll have a four-game first half of the week, Monday through Thursday, in FBC formats. Three of those teams are also teams that had a full weekend. Miami, the New York Mets, and Houston. So they're playing the full weekend, the opening weekend of the season, and then the full four games to start the season. I think you briefly alluded to that fact as well. The second full week of the season, there are 12 teams with a seven-game slate, still none with that dreaded five-game week. We don't see that till the third full week of the season, Baltimore and Washington, with both Monday and Thursday off. Now, This is what's really interesting. We start breaking this down more and more. And of course, as closer we get, we start looking at pitchers. But in the first three full weeks of the season, three teams play a four-game first half of the week. Cincinnati, Boston, Philadelphia. Makes me love Derek Hall even more (laughs) because he's a platoon guy. Right. Strong side of platoon getting Won't four hurt. games yep. in the first big. There's a good chance he's playing three out of four in all three of those weeks. Our Cincinnati Reds, we like their ballpark. Exactly half of their games are at home when they start the season. Boston Red Sox, Sox another park we like for this. That's three teams I'm going to be concentrating on in these late rounds, looking at guys that were could can fill in for us. We got we have a whole bunch of teams only playing two games out of three on the very first weekend of the season. These are the kinds of guys I'm looking at rounds 25 to 30 already. And uh, yeah, Cincinnati, Boston, Philadelphia, four full games in the first half of the week for three consecutive weeks to start the season. I think that's huge. I think it works the other way as well, Kevin. I'm not just looking at guys you can pick up to take advantage of the extra uh, plate appearances, but also realizing who you drafted early who you're going to be missing out on, like the guys that are, they're going to have a lot of off days. You're going to need to fill that, have that backfill either in the first week of fab, or if it's, you want to save yourself some time looking at who can fill in for those positions with your last two picks as well. It works in both the first five rounds and the last five rounds as well. So I think that's a great call out there. And yes, we'll be talking plenty about the schedule as we break it down, especially when we get to the opportunity section and the batting average and just taking advantage of as many plate appearances as possible and breaking down those ratios as well. But you know what? I think that's going to wrap it up for episode 101. Art, thank you so much for taking the time. We hit the 90-minute mark. That's our target. It felt weird to only hit the 60-minute mark at PitchCon, so I'm glad that we are able to stretch it out a little bit more, get in our more of our comfort zone. Thanks for taking the time and joining us. Can you uh, remind everybody where they can hear your voice, Any other anything else you're working on as spring training rolls around? 
I want to thank you guys for having me. This is one of my favorite podcasts. I listen to almost every show you guys put out. I'm a regular listener, so it's it's great to be on here talking with you guys. I'm at Triple Play Fantasy. We do the Triple Play Fantasy Baseball Show every week. We put that out. comes out Thursday morning. We're doing our position preview series right now, like I said, and our, our podcast feed also has the Fantasy Baseball Beat where beat writers are are interviewed on their local team and the call up if you're a dynasty or prospect guy we have some really good prospect guys and Vinny and Michael Richards we're putting out a lot of content now we're fully in baseball mode we're fully in our our degenerate mode right now come on check us out i'll see you guys over there yeah make sure you are checking out the triple play podcast feed it's great when, in my opinion, I joked about this a couple of pods ago that you guys have all these different shows, but your titles of your episodes are so long that I never know which one it's going to be <laughs> until I hit play. And I'm like, oh, great. It's a nice little surprise. But I love the fact that it's all on one feed. That's why I like the picture list feed is like that as well. So it's nice that you get all that stuff in one spot. Those three shows alone are great. We we always talk about the baseball beat. We've had all those guys on the show as well. And it's, a, hey, nominated for FSWA podcast of the the year after only having six episodes i think that's a pretty big accomplishment in it's, and of itself it, it's pretty incredible those guys it's a tough it's a tough concept to bring to an actual show sure I, and they me, do a great job with it yeah i didn't want to do it i was like no don't, i don't want to be trying to find a new beat writer every week to interview don't ask me but these, they're doing a great job and they're put they're working their butts off that's why it's so good yeah you can and you can tell that in every episode the length that they talk about things the depth in which they talk about things so make sure you guys are if you're not already you're doing it wrong you should make sure that you're catching up on all the teams that they've already been and they'll be continue to do that throughout the course of the offseason as well all right make sure you are following art on the twitter as you mentioned at art tpf you should already be following this pod on the twitter at on the wire pod right after giving us a rating and review of course wherever you are listening to this podcast it's greatly appreciated it goes a long way you hear everybody say that but it's absolutely true it's why everybody says it please make sure you do that even if you just throw in the five stars and you don't even leave a review though the review helps a little bit that's going to wrap it up for episode 101 of on the wire i'd like to once again thank thank our guest art torn bean for joining us after all that, I am Adam Howe. On behalf of Kevin Hastings, thanks for listening. We bid you goodbye. Aloha, everybody. Yeah.